this holiday message was originally recorded during the winter solstice 2020 and is a preview of the Bob Thurman podcast. To learn more about the Bob Thurman podcast, please visit his website at bobthurman.com. Greetings, everyone. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and Happy Solstice. I am talking just at the moment of the solstice, approximately like right in the time when we're just beginning the re-arisal of the, of the light, you know, from the time where it had more or less disappeared. And so it's a very auspicious time. All of the cultures on the world, in the whole planet, in the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, I guess, uh, particularly, have a special ritual at this time. And uh, also, I happen to be doing something for a dear friend who uh, was a colleague of mine back in the 80s and 90s, uh, William Irwin Thompson, who wrote a wonderful book when he was at MIT uh, called At the Edge of History. And then he organized something called the Lindisfarne Foundation, very much funded by Lawrence Rockefeller, a visionary member of the Rockefeller family. And um, he, um, uh, the late Lawrence Rockefeller, a wonderful man. And uh, he, uh, uh, he passed away, and his son is offering his ashes to a river at this moment, uh, you know, at the time of the return of the light, you know, like as a symbol of his returning uh, from the bardo into another creative and wonderful life. Son and daughter are doing the ritual like that, and they're just they're making it up themselves. Wonderful, I think, really. And people all over the world who are in, in the Lindisfarne Association uh, Lindisfarne Fellowship's uh, sort of orbit are doing different things to celebrate Bill Thompson's um, transcendence, of course, whatever they think of he's doing. I personally have been reading the Book of the Dead, uh, encouraging him in the between state, in the Bardo state, to uh, return in a good way and, um, and uh, continue his uh, pioneering effort to enter the help us all enter the new age that we need so in this time of the renewal of the light and also the renewal of the american government perhaps uh, we really must be thinking of how to uh, rebalance our life on earth and um, you know I, I, that the one thing i used to love when i was a child and still to even more so today, thanks to Buddhism, I appreciate Christianity even more than I did then. As my mother told me, I was always a little rebellious about the ministers and the pastors, and they said, you have to believe this, believe that. And I always loved this Christmas time because I love baby Jesus, you know. Everyone loves that story, and the shepherd, and the shepherds, you know, and the three wise men coming. I was always wishing in those days in my youth for some wise men to come and discover me <laughs> in, the, in the middle of New York City, in the middle of what I considered somehow a strange culture, which I didn't know why I considered it strange. But I, I do now, having rediscovered the uh, uh, Buddhist culture of Tibet and ancient India and Mongolia and present Mongolia and Tibet and as battered as they have been in the last uh, 100 years, you know, almost 170 years, you know, in the case of Mongolia, almost 100 years. And um, something about the, the Western culture, you know, it's militarism and it's consumerism and somehow the sort of the backwardness of the European uh, tribes in West Eurasia compared to the great civilizations of the India and China and so on. You know, always made me feel a little something. But anyway, this is our wonderful time, the Yule log, sort of some sort of pagan thing on which the birth of the savior is connected. And it's wonderful that people feel saved by Jesus. I think it really, really is. I feel saved by Jesus myself. But it's just that I don't agree that he's the only one who saved human beings. And also I don't agree with the theology that animals don't have souls. 
I'm like Albert Schweitzer, who was a good, very pious and good Christian and did wonderful good works in Africa, as well as with his wonderful organ music, you know, in many cathedrals throughout Europe, where he didn't also agree with that theological thing uh, coming from the Middle East, that animals do not have souls. Of course they do. Animals have been humans in previous lives. I love the... the um, uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhist thing about the beginninglessness of the universe. We've all had infinite past lives and therefore we've all been every kind of animal, sort of a Darwinian interconnectionness of all species and individuals, more than Darwin because interconnection of the individual members of the species as well. As well. So that, um, that there's always a saving from death and horrible states like hells and torture states of different kinds that different cultures have imagined in the world and that different beings do experience, even in the, among the ones we see, terrible life forms where basically the suffering of life is accentuated dreadfully by others, you know, in case of others. And humans, although we also suffer a lot, we are so privileged in connection to these more, much more dreadful states that we see even in the animal kingdom, not to speak of the hell states and the preta realm states, the hungry, hungry beings, you know, hunger and thirst being states, sort of worse than insects, you could say. And, um, and these are all available to biologically to, to beings, living beings and humans, we've all been these kind of things. We could be them again if we live a careless and destructive human life and a, and a stupid one and a deluded one, you know. And um, I'm very happy that that to me has enriched Christianity, my own Christianity enormously, which I was born in. So the Christmas thing, we always, with our children, we always celebrate, although we consider ourselves Buddhists, uh, but we don't consider it to be a kind of Buddhism that excludes other traditions. We we have a vision of Buddhism, which I have to give credit to His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, for helping me develop, where it incorporates all of the other religions, you know, and it reinforces them, and it, 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 it loves their triumph, actually, but not their exclusivism. It feels that the misunderstanding of the founders who had visions of the vastness of the divine energy in the universe, but of course fitted it into older tribal notions in general, uh, which meant, you know, gives them an edge of exclusivism because of tribal exclusivism that we do not agree with, you know. But it doesn't mean that there couldn't be a particularism of the individual, you know, where, where each individual has a particular way and path that they can choose and they don't try to do everything at once, that's okay. But then when it becomes a tribal thing, like our nation has this and this is our religion and it's not yours and only our people that have our religion are saved and yours aren't and so on. The young Dalai, even the young Dalai Lama always taught that before religions had any sort of social power when they were submerged under the religion of secularism, you can call it kind of ideology or religion of secularism. And he always spoke about the need for inclusivity. And even since I converted, I considered myself converted to Buddhism. I was not that receptive to it early on in the game, you know, with him. But I learned it. I learned it with him gradually over the years. So anyway, anyway now is not the time to go into full scale, pluralistic, multi-religion, <laughs> Include, but inclusivist theology, let's call it, or Buddhology, as I like to think of myself. And not the time to do that in any technical detail, but it's just a time to celebrate that of one and a half billion people on this planet feel somehow wish to touch. And I think many of the so-called secularists have this little bit underlying idea in their own mind, feel touched by the idea that a savior of the ultimate sort of power and energy of the universe is present for them. You know, was born at a certain time, lived a certain life, showed the transcendence of death. It shouldn't focus on show the torturousness of life by being killed by the Romans, but rather show it, and he was the Romans who killed him, it should be clear. 
not the Jews, the Romans. He was Jewish himself. And uh, so, the, you know, showed that transcendence of death by rising from a dreadful form of death uh, and uh, blessing the world with an arisen form, which is the key to the tradition, rather than gloomy, you know, like, like dwelling on the suffering and rubbing one's nose in the suffering, which the Romans liked to do, actually. And they liked the, the one of the Jewish people to do it, actually. And later, when they became big empire, they wanted the bigger empire. They wanted their own subjects to have their nose rubbed in suffering and pride, while they were li living it up in their palaces, you know, and in their in their licentiousness and so on. The Roman emperors misusing and abusing Christianity, Christ's great teaching. So anyway, now is the time to celebrate the advent of love and compassion and in something inconceivable that, you know, that uh, the universe is good. The universe loves all the beings. The universe wants the good outcome, the happy ending for life. In fact, infinite positive life, happy life, blissful life for all beings, not just the human ones and not just the Christian ones, all of them or the Jewish ones or the Muslim ones or the Buddhist ones or the Hindu ones or the Taoist ones or the Sikh ones or the Baha'i ones or whichever ones it is, but all of them and not just, you know, absolutely all. And that's a wonderful vision and that's the vision we need now. Too much societies terrorize their subjects of the authorities, either religious or political, and make them feel that the world is bad, you know. The secularists, even your know, nature is red in tooth and claw, so be scared of the wild animals, be scared of the viruses, be scared of death, be scared of violence. Nature is violent and we have a very tenuous place and so we have to go around and shoot everybody, <laughs> shoot all the other animals. And, pave it all over and make a parking lot out of it. Crazy sense of being isolated, alienated from nature that we have in the Western Europe, the Western Eurasia, you know, both the desert societies of the Middle East and the rather poor societies of the temperate climate Europe, where there weren't so many rich river valleys and where there was heavy warfare all the time and tribalism. And, you know, Vikings and Saxons and Angles and people clubbing each other the head with stone axes and really quite, quite dreadful compared to the great alluvial civilizations of Persia, China and India and, ancient, and Egypt even, and Africa, the Niger in ancient times, you know, quite dreadful. And probably the ancient civilizations of the Americas were also more gentle. So we are still products of that legacy. We made a world empire about our, out of our violence. And we're still threatening the world with our nuclear weapons and things like that. And the Russians are really like us. They're like the same whitey Western European Viking lineages, you know, out to conquer everybody because they're being scared of everybody. So this comes from a vision of the universe being hostile. And somehow, as hopeless as it is, to fight off an infinite other, try even it involves kind of pretending that it's not infinite. And so we can kind of conquer everybody. Somehow uh, the, our, God, our God will help us conquer everybody. Well, that's really silly. You know? And so moments like Christmas, moments like Hanukkah where they light all the candles and they, they burn for days and days and it's inconceivable and miraculous where sort of the power of something inconceivable and beyond our notions of power, the power of the infinite, you could even say, we call it, we can call it the divine if you like, but it's somehow the power of the infinite can come in and reinforce a frightened little finite being, like a human being or a member of this and that tribe. And it can somehow make us safe and secure and happy because it doesn't seem like the world wants to make us happy, you see. So, but they, when there's an idea that the infinite comes in and sends a, sends a messiah, a saver, a savior, a saving being, uh, not in, just even in the form of one of the original meanings of messiah, which is a saving king who makes the tribe triumphant over the neighboring tribes. 
but also the idea of a saving king of the universe <coughs> that makes the individual who <coughs> connects to that savior, makes the individual able to feel they can fend off the infinite universe. That's much more inconceivable than just a political savior. Although they're kind of mixed, once it's tribalized, it gets kind of mixed. So this is a moment of thinking that little baby Jesus in the manger out there with the animals being born with the stars even coming and shining over him and the angels and the wise men from the ancient, more ancient cultures of the East and more knowledgeable cultures from the further East of the wealthy river valleys, you know, Tigris, Euphrates and Indus and uh, Ganga and uh, Yamuna and then the great uh, Yellow River and the Yangtze River of Asia, the Mekong River, supporting greater agricultural surplus than could be done in the desert or in Europe in those days. Although Danube was pretty strong in its day. Anyway, this is the time of celebrating that the universe loves you. And if you have to think of that, that the universe only sends Jesus to love you, it's all right. It's only for you, it can be only. The only if you take the only as yourself, as an individual. And try not to make only your tribe. And therefore think of other tribes as doomed and as cannon fodder for your own sort of relative insecurity around you. And then distort Jesus' liberating teaching of love thine enemy as thyself, of altruism and love and compassion as the strong force of the universe. And distort that into thinking that that makes you triumphalist over others who don't, who don't know about him as their savior, have different savior figures themselves. And so instead, think of the divine infinite power as being able to save in many other ways everyone. And therefore you have your way and others have their way and they should be respected like you are happy when they respect yours. That's where we need to be, okay? Even at Christmas, I can be that theological or Buddha logical to usher in a new age in the world religions of true pluralism, where they can accept that each other, each one saves, and therefore they don't need to convert and conquer the others through some sort of nominal conversion. Everyone should convert themselves to the vision of the positive universe, loving the, the loving universe and the force of love. And once they convert themselves to that through whichever cultural mode, whichever savior figure, Avalokiteshvar, you know, in the case of the Tibetan Buddhists, and Mrs. Avalokiteshvar, Tara, you know, females, and, so, and then whatever other there are in every other culture. And that's what we can celebrate, that we have ours. We Christians, you know, from in the West, that Jesus came. And he came in a harsh environment, which wouldn't tolerate his teaching of love, actually. And uh, the conquerors who were dominating his actually more gentle culture, the wonderful Abrahamic culture of the Jews, which was actually more gentle than the kind of more violent Roman gods, you know you know, operating under their sort of Zeus and Athena and Mars, you know, the more gentle, omnip the more gentle, you know, monotheistic idea of the invisible deity that was beyond any tribe, that was beyond any city state, that was beyond any idol, that couldn't be owned, therefore, by some sort of, you know, urban polity, an emperor type of person. That was the great Abrahamic breakthrough from which Jewish, you know, Jesus came and for Judaism and then Jesus as a great rabbi, but then Judaism came. But that gentleness was not shared by the Romans and therefore the Romans corrupted it with their violence like they killed him instead of letting him have 30, 40 years to share his teaching of love. You know, who says it was so great that he could only teach for four years? He should have been, been given tenure in the, in a, a Rome and a Jerusalem sponsored academy to teach people the power of love. Yeah. 
what is this? You know, idolizing a particular history. No way. That's idolatry. We don't need that. We really don't. But that's a theological step that will still perhaps take some generations. You know, I, you know whatever. Anyway, the point is this is Merry Christmas. And think of it as everybody's in the Northern Hemisphere's renewal of the light. And uh, the uh, new log, you know, the different the fire of the tree, you know, the tree takes the energy of the sun, codifies it into a thing where you're going to have a little sun in a fireplace. You know, the sun's energy seems to be go, have been going away for six months now, and now it starts to come back. And then lightning and thunder are also the energy of the sun. In ancient Vedic India, they had the idea of the three fires which were the fire of the sun itself, the fire of the lightning, uh, the, the thunderbolt, and then the fire of fire place, which was the offering fire, which was the channel therefore back to the sun. It was like kindling a little mini sun, you know, and it showed the benevolence of, the, of flame actually, the benevolence of the element of heat, of making life possible for the, sentient being, sensitive being like a human being. And so that's what we celebrate today. And then the, the greatest sun, the, the, the energy and the flame that is more powerful actually than physical burning hydrogen or nuclear fission or fusion, nuclear fusion even, you know, however many millions of degrees, the more powerful fire is the fire of love, the fire of beings caring for other beings and beings hooking up with them through empathy, through feeling their feelings and therefore being gentle and not harmful and creating more love like the female being the form among the humans that is more alert to that interconnectedness of us all. And uh, so Mary is part of, the, part of the message, not just Jesus, like the Shekinah, is part of the grace of God, not just, not just God all alone like a bachelor. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy, however the Muslims celebrate this time. I, I must admit my ignorance in that, but everybody does some way of celebrating the solstice in the Northern Hemisphere anyway, and we should join in that. Okay, and and Bill Thompson. May your next life be a theologian who helps transcend the mixture of tribalism and deep, deep faith in the loving, the triumph of the loving energy of the universe, which is what we all need to, to be able to embrace in order to be lo truly loving, feel it's safe to be truly loving and compassionate ourselves. Okay, all the best. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Men Love membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House Men Love membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us and menla.org.